Hi, I'm Ruth. And I'm Brenton. Welcome to Spectrum today. Ruth, in just a few minutes, we have a great interview coming up with Kelly Mensa. And he is with the uh, Albuquerque Policing Council, helps to coordinate that and have a good discussion with him. So stay with That's us. Me. That's going to be good. Uh, as we get started today, though, there is a lot in the news coming mm -hmm. in off of this weekend. You know, we, yeah. uh, I guess we should talk about several things that have, have happened. One of them that kind of caught my attention, there's a there's a lot of things that have caught my attention, but one came out of the city of Chicago. Did you hear oh, okay, no. that the mayor of the city of Chicago is uh, suing two uh, car manufacturers because he says they did not get, they misled people by saying that they had good anti-theft deterrent things wow. on their car. And you know, now that all these cars are getting stolen in Chicago, it's the car manufacturer's fault. And Whoa. I mean, at what point do you just blame the criminals for ripping people off? Wow. I, uh, he's getting a, a lot of blowback because people are like, wow. hey, this has to do with, with the thieves. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to do with the car manufacturers. So one of his quotes is clearly, we don't have a crime problem. We have a Kia problem in the city of Chicago. So I think that's pretty unbelievable it is unbelievable but so is that because they are they're claiming that their cars are safe and apparently they're not well according secure? to secure i mean yeah, yeah i, I, I can't yes. tell you how secure yes. or what type of anti-theft deterrence the, the mayor is complaining about but i just think at some point you have to blame the people who are doing the crime yeah i mean it's I, I, I just find that one almost unbelievable it's amazing that that we would do that Here, here's another one that is uh really going to apply to a lot of people. The housing market experts are saying maybe mired in this kind of slow slow go for a while because uh, the housing market is hitting interest rates that are now above 7%. Mm -hmm. And uh, as things have exceeded that number, uh, it's some of the highest rates that they've seen in a couple decades. I mean, it, it's not the highest ever by any means, but as house prices have gone up mm -hmm. and the uh, interest rate has gone up. That has really kind of put a damper yeah. on a lot of people finding it affordable. Well, that's exactly right because you're paying more per square foot for the homes that you have. And so a home that was maybe, I don't know, 1,500 to 1,800 square feet, which is a smaller home now. What happened in COVID is people were buying a whole bunch of square footage, remember, because they're staying home mm -hmm. and um, you want room for your family. Now I think it's Smaller homes, but you're paying more per square foot for those homes. Well, that, and, then, and then to even find a home that, to yeah, even find a house. Because so many people are holding on to what they call legacy mortgages. If you've got a, a, a mortgage that's under four, specifically three and a half, three and a quarter, it's hard to be motivated to go out and say, mm -hmm. well, I'm going to sell my house and maybe buy a smaller house yeah. and pay as much or more because of the interest home, rates. Yes. So this could be some slow going for a while. Yeah. It's not forecast to be easy soon. Another well, one, what do you want to talk about? Because uh, I want to talk whatever. about a, a, an article that I came across about a dog who is who is a had found a foster. His parents, these parents, these people were thinking about adopting him. They fostered him, right, for a little while. You keep him for a little bit. It's two or three no, days, they, right? A weekend. Well, yes. And so they were spoiling him. They kept him. They decided to keep him overnight and not send him back to the shelter. Okay. Okay. They were on a houseboat, and everyone fell asleep. Well, he alerted them that uh, another boat nearby had was on fire. So he alerted them by barking and get, because it spread quickly to their boat. Wow. So he saved them. So he becomes a hero. Uh, someone sees him, adopts him the next day. But then realizing that he's such a large dog and they didn't have room for him, someone else who had who learned that the adoption fell through. And they found out that Moose was just, you know, was a great dog and they didn't want him to go back to the shelter. Uh -huh. Adopted him. She has over five acres of land and wow. other pets. And so he's a, he's a beautiful dog. And, awesome. and I thought that was just great because they were saying that's pretty amazing that he did that not, not really knowing them. knowing it was, the family well. Right. He uh, had only, well, there was, it was a family of five, I believe, on the houseboat. And they said that they could have been lost. Yeah. Lost their lives if it wouldn't have been. Those pets for, are something else. Moose barking and alerting them to the danger. Yes. That's pretty cool. Isn't that cool? That is cool. Well, speaking of fire. Okay. The Hawaii fires, they now believe they have figured out what was the cause. Now, we heard a lot of, a lot of uh, folks saying, oh, it's global warming that has caused all of the 
uh, the fires that are you know, happening. Well, truth be told, a lawsuit has now been filed. It was filed last Thursday by the government of Maui County, Hawaii, alleging wow. that Hawaii elect- a Hawaiian electric company uh, and its subsidiaries failed to properly actually shut down some live electrical lines, and then they had these red flag winds, Windstorm. and that it that's what caused it. It really had nothing to do with the fact that it was so sad. a uh, you know global warming event. It had to do with the fact that there were maybe a live electrical lines on the ground, wow. and they didn't get shut down. You know, it, it's it's crazy to me how everything, it, people try to put it in a box. Hey, let me, let me make this news headline fit in my box. Mm. And it's so much of the time when the truth comes out about how things happen, it makes some of these narratives look awfully silly, yeah. awfully crazy. The sad so, thing is some people were lost and it's been people, a devastating 100, fire. Well over a hundred mm-hmm. people. So yeah, tragic. And there's still several people missing. They haven't been able to find, they don't know what's happened to them. But so many people who have come forward and are really trying to help. So that's a good thing as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. For sure. I had another article that I want to talk about, about pen pals. Did you ever have a pen pal growing up? Not really. Did you ever do anything like ever? I mean, maybe like once. Hear I don't about remember that? like a, you know, a sustained pen pal. Well, we had a story on two 80-year-old uh, women, Patsy Gregory and Caroline Kraus, who had been swapping letters since 1955. Wow. <laughs> That's a long time. How many they letters never did met. they swap? They'd never met each other, so they, they always remembered each other's birthdays, the wedding anniversaries. They would send each other Christmas cards, but had never met in person. One lived in the UK. Mm-hmm. The other one lived in the United States. And the family of the one who lived in the UK surprised her with a ticket Okay. to, I believe it was South Carolina. And um, what is it? South as, Carolina. Uh, yeah. I believe it was South Carolina, and she came and met her for the first time. So they said it was as though... It's like meeting an old friend. Have you ever met somebody and you're just like, we just click? Well, it was more than that because they knew so much about each other. So it was very comfortable. And I just thought that was an amazing story. Can you imagine staying in contact with someone for that, all those years? That's pretty well, cool. Well, they started when they were about 12, 12 years, years old. old. One of them at that time lived around the Great Lakes. And so one of the things that they would talk about, they would talk about the weather and what it was like. And then, you know, as they moved through life, uh, one of them got married, the next one got married yes. the next year. Both of them had three children. They shared, you know, a lot of those commonalities. And if you talk to somebody that often uh, by letter, I think it said that they had written around 800 letters, of almost 400 each. They were both in Girl Scouts. Huh. They were both Girl Scouts. That was their connectivity point. Yes. So isn't that cool? That was pretty cool. And then to save those letters. And then to be a family that find those letters later on, that'd be really neat. So instead of pen pals next day, do we have text pals? Email pals. <laughs> Does that, <laughs> that work? People don't write as many That's letters. That's true. They don't. Do and they? a lot of people don't even, you know what I heard the other day uh, on the news is that so many people don't even know how to write in cursive I've anymore. Heard that too. They've lost that. How do you sign your name if you don't know how to write in cursive? I don't Are we going to go back to the Maybe days it's just the where name. people put the giant X with their Maybe name? it's just the name that they, you know, sign. But if you're going to write a letter, they just for, they forgot well, how to do don't that. You, don't you write your name in cursive? Isn't that the concept? Sure. So if we lose cursive. How do we have a signature? Okay, just I don't a know. Question that's just, that I'm just saying that's what I about. heard the other day. Maybe it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, as you, you look at some of the things, some of the information is good, some of the information is kind of interesting, and some of it is, is kind, of a, kind of sad situations. I did hear, however, of a grandmother mm-hmm. who went skydiving mm-hmm. at age 90. She'd done it at age 80. Yes. Her granddaughter surprised her at age 90, and she did it with them for yes. her 90th birthday. She was not nervous at all. They were nervous. She just did it. If I was going to be jumping out of an airplane, I'd be terrified. I know. I know you I'm would. I'm scared of heights. I do not. Why? I, it's not even appealing to me. Ruth, on she the said other she's hand, a, might yeah, do it. But yes, I would I'd do not. it. I would do it. I would, would do it. Yeah. I why? think I, because I, that's just something okay. you'd never do. I mean, that's exactly. amazing. That's something you would never so do. So she's looking forward to maybe repeating it at 95. Didn't r- rule it out, huh? Mm-mm. Okay. Pretty cool. Well. I guess Imagine sharing something like that with your grandparent. That's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. It was two granddaughters. They were both, I don't know if they were teenagers or young adults, but they were they were younger folks. Yeah, pretty so cool. Stuff. Well, that kind of brings you up to date on a few things. 
uh, that are going on in our world. We've got a great interview with Kelly Minson coming up in just a minute, so stay with us. Watch the Daystar Network 24 hours a day on KAZQ 32.5. We want to bring you up to date on how we are progressing through the months of July and August with our fundraising. We've talked to you about the fact that we need to really see a, a group of 200 folks making a $100 donation to help us reach that $20,000 mark and we're about a quarter of the way. We only have about a week left and we really need to see a lot of folks jump in and get involved in the next few days because we are running out of time. To be honest with you, the month of uh, August has been pretty difficult uh, equipment-wise. We have had a lot of technical challenges over the course of the last few weeks. And uh, the reason that we've come to you is because periodically we get into situations where we really need some extra help financially with some of these equipment costs. And that's really what we're up against. Really could would appreciate you making that one-time donation to help us pass this difficult time. Thank you for watching Alpha Omega Broadcasting. Many of you did call while we were out over the weekend. The signal was down, and we appreciate your calls and prayers, but we also appreciate your support. So if you'd like to visit us online, you can do so at kazq32.org and just allocate it for the giving challenge. You can call into the station anytime from about 9 to 4, and that's 505-884-8355, extension 101, because it's automated to speak to someone. Or if you have a donation ready, you can send it to Alpha Omega Broadcasting. We're at 4501 Montgomery Boulevard Northeast, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87109. Remember, there are other levels to get involved. We have great family programming, and you can sponsor that with 30, your gift of $32 a month. Any other gift is allocated towards giving or for the president partner level with your gift of $50, $75, or like I said, any other amount. Thank you for all that you do. Watch Jimmy Swagger and the Sun Life Network 24 hours a day on KAZQ 32.3. We're privileged to have with us today Kelly Minsa, who is with the Albuquerque Policing Council. And uh, we've had you with us before, Kelly, but it's been a while. Welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be able to kind of catch up on some of the things that are taking place with policing in the the city of Albuquerque. Why don't you start us off today, though, and just tell us what is the Albuquerque Policing Council? I think a lot of people probably don't even know what it is. Uh, too many of us, unfortunately, uh, don't know what it is. The Albuquerque Community Policing Council was started in 2015 by Mayor Barry in advance of what's called the uh, uh, Court Approved Settlement Agreement, which is a uh, basically an oversight agreement with the Department of Justice to help Albuquerque uh, Police Department do some things differently. Uh, they did some things which probably shouldn't have been done, and they, we got some help from out of town. One of the parts of the settlement agreement was that Albuquerque PPD had to increase community policing, which is be more open with the neighborhoods, with our community groups, and uh, speak to us and let us know what we're doing. So we, we uh, arranged six councils around the city, one in each police area command to have monthly meetings, to discuss topics of law enforcement, crime, policing, and uh, et cetera, and just to get Albuquerque Police Department an opportunity to speak to the public, find out what they want to know and what they want to hear and how they can improve. Okay, now Kelly, I, you know this is that's a that's a big topic and it's a big that's a challenging area for our community and for a lot of communities and not just Albuquerque but especially in Albuquerque. What got you interested in being involved with uh, the Community Policing Council? Well, I've always uh, been sort of a civic-minded person involved, and I, I, I think I would have been a pretty good cop, but I missed that opportunity being younger. They are, they are taking people now. There's a couple guys my age in the academy, in case you're interested. But, uh, uh, you know, I just felt as though it would be a good opportunity for me to help the city, for me to help people get together and uh, get to meet each other, and for the police not to be seen as a negative influence on the city, which some people, especially in poor neighborhoods, think they are. I, I think I've met a lot of police officers, and they, they are very good people in general. Well, it's a hard job. I mean, I think most folks would agree that when you need a police officer, you're looking for somebody for help, usually. It's not just, you know, just for a random situation. I saw you say the other day, you know, why aren't the police there when you need them? Well, you know, and that maybe that's a valid question. 
it does seem, even in Albuquerque, that response times are longer. And when you go to these council meetings, um, what are some of the concerns? What are the concerns that people bring up in different six area commands of Albuquerque to say, hey, this is a challenge that we've got? What are the things that you hear as a common thread? Well, we hear a lot of the same things. I bet um, you do. Basically, homelessness. Yeah. And homelessness is a difficult subject to discuss because being homeless in and of itself is not a crime. No. So, uh, you know, it's, it's some of the things that go along with homelessness, the loitering and the loitering and, you know, the, the scaring people and that sort of stuff that people are concerned about. Uh, we also hear about retail theft, which is big, uh, car jacking and uh, c catalytic converters theft. And uh, what should I do if I get a home invasion? Am I allowed to use my firearm? We hear that one a lot. And uh, how can I pr protect myself? And what are some things I do in my house or in my business that are going to cut down the opportunity for a criminal? We hear a lot of that sort of stuff in our meetings. Co common questions that are really almost ripped from the headlines, aren't they? I mean, those are things that that most folks have heard about. I mean, carjackings, Albuquerque has been near the front, not always at the very top, but often close to the top or at the top of carjackings. Right. Retail theft is a national problem that uh, we've all probably witnessed. I mean, I've eyewitnessed retail theft, I think a handful of times myself, and you see people walking out of stores with things. So what sort of requirements or commitments does somebody have to make to serve on the council if they want to be somebody who's communicating community concerns to the police department? Well, we are really, uh, we at one point we had a lot of requirements. Uh, you had to go through the uh, Civilian Policing Academy, which, Citizens Policing Academy, excuse me, which is two nights a week for three months where you learn every aspect of policing, you get a basic idea of what they do, and you had to do a background check and do ride-alongs with the police. We All cut, sound like good ideas. Yeah, and they are good ideas, but we wanted to get a more well-rounded, uh, group of representatives, the more people who have the time to spend two nights a week are your older people who are retired, and those are the type of people who tend to do volunteer work anyway. Sure. That's perfectly fine, but we wanted to open it up to younger people, people in uh, disadvantaged communities, people who have their kids at home still, so we cut those out. Now at this point, if you want to serve on the Albuquerque Community Policing Council, you just have to want to put the effort in, uh, speak you know, do your do your time studying and learning about the issues, speak to the police, come with interesting questions, and be ready to make recommendations. When did you make the changes with the requirements? Was it a recent change, or has it gone back a while? That was almost three years ago, okay. two and a half years so, ago. Not, not too recent. Right. Uh, have you seen more people be able to engage? I mean, that you know, yeah. you, you change the requirements and you hope for a, a bigger pool. Right. Did you catch a bigger pool? Uh, our membership has gone up slightly, but not fully. Uh, we, we are slotted for 11 slots of uh, six in six different area commands, so 66 uh, councilors in the city, and we tend to run 50, 52, 55, so we're a little little short. We're constantly looking for people because there is a turnover. Okay, know? yeah, people c come and go in any type of volunteer position, That's and this right. is volunteer. This yes. is not paid, right? Totally volunteer. You get the opportunity to make recommendations to the police department. If you see something that you don't like that's wrong, that you feel could be improved, you can make this recommendation. And because of our court approved settlement agreement, the police chief or somebody up on the fifth floor, which is what they call the staff downtown, uh, has to look over it and get back to us within 45 days. So. Uh, you do have some power to change your neighborhood if you join the police council. Okay, well, that, that's interesting. Now, what are we uh, hoping to achieve? Is there like a goal that you would, would say, hey, this is uh, maybe something we have achieved and maybe something we would like to achieve as you're looking at some of the councils and the things that they have been bringing forward? Well, one thing I've tried to do personally, uh, being in charge of the program, is that I've tried to bring the six councils a little more together because originally the way the document was written by the city council, they were totally separate and then little by little we're trying to bring them together because this is one city. Yeah. So, uh, you know, trying to unify thought, unify meetings and, and get a little bit more uh, continuity. Uh, continuity from one to the next is one of our major things. 
What are the six different areas? You mentioned that there's six area commands. So, you know, for a regular citizen, they may not have any idea what you're talking about. Right. I'm assuming we're talking about different regions of the city. It's yes. not, it's, we're quadrantized in Albuquerque, you know, Northeast, Southeast, Northwest, Southwest, but, right. but it, that doesn't probably match up perfectly. Kind of explain that to us. Well, we got the Southwest, which is uh, south of Coors and uh, west of, uh, well, is it? No, excuse me, south of I-40 and west of Coors. We've okay. got the northwest, which is north of I-40 up to Rio Rancho. Okay. We've got the valley, which is all the way from uh, Los Ranchos down to uh, Bridge Street or so, which is and uh, between I-25 <laughs> I and Coors. Yeah, it's a large area with some, some county land in there. We have the uh, foothills, which is east of Eubank, up to, uh, all the way up to the foothills, okay. and all the way across. And we have the northeast and southeast, which are divided um, by, uh, what is it, by central. Okay. So, yeah. So those are large sections of the city. I mean, yeah. if you think of that, the, and there's a lot of neighborhoods, different variety of, I'm sure, situations in different neighborhoods, even every, every yeah. one of those area commands. What, what's the plans for CPC for the next year? What, where do you think things are going? Well, we are still, as a city, working our way to get out of the consent decree. We're almost there. We've been in for eight years now, and we're looking uh, with APD and with the policing council, the uh, Citizens Police Oversight Agency and the rest, to get out of that and start self-governing. And that may happen within the next few months. We'll see. And we are still trying to increase our mission, get more people to attend the meetings, get more people to uh, just come by, see what we're doing, join the council, sure. speak to your local area commander, meet your local police officers. If someone wants to volunteer or find out more, Kelly, how can they connect? Is it best to do an email or is it best yeah. to go to the website? What, do you, what would you recommend? You can just uh, do a search for a community uh, policing council in Albuquerque. Okay. Uh, my, my email box is cpc at cabq.gov. Okay. And uh, my phone number is 505-366-1389. Please give me a call. Great. Well, some good information for us today uh, by Kelly Mensa, who is working as uh, the coordinator for Albuquerque Police Council. And it uh, kind of brings us up to date on some of the things that are happening between the community and Albuquerque Police Department. Kelly, thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Here in the Old Testament, in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 26, it begins by telling us about one of the kings of Judah by the name of Uzziah. Ruth, why don't you tell us a little bit about him? Let's, okay. let's pick up the read about King Uzziah today. Verse 3, we'll be reading verses 3 through 5. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother was Jechaliah from Jerusalem. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his father Amaziah had done. Uzziah sought God during the days of Zechariah, who taught him to fear God. As long as the king sought guidance from the Lord, God gave him success. Let's read about some of the successes that he had. Okay. Look at them. You can look over this chapter. He went to battle with the Philistines. He broke down the walls of Gath and Jabna and Ashdod. We know that he built, it says, new towns in the Ashdod area and other parts of Philistia. That, that's something that he was able to accomplish. Uh, he was able to, to fight against the Minyanites and the Arabs. And scripture says <clears throat> that his fame spread even to Egypt and he, where he became very powerful. So mm -hmm. he obviously was a man who had a reputation of strength, but it wasn't just in the areas of fighting uh, or, or uh, building. It says that he was also a man who loved the soil. Mm, okay. And he had great farms, and he had uh, wonderful vineyards, and he saw some wonderful things. He began to fortify the city of Jerusalem. You can see that in about verse 9. He built uh, up uh, towers in Jerusalem uh, at the corner gate and the valley gate and at the angle in the wall. And he, he even constructed things, it says, it's and that provided them mm -hmm. with uh, uh, extra defenses as they would shoot the, the large rocks or stones and uh, would shoot the arrows. He provided his army that says that he had a trained army that was uh, on uh -huh. standby of over 300,000 Men and he provided yeah. them with uh, spears and shields and coats of mail. I mean, yes. th 
lot of success. Very successful. Mm -hmm. And then you get down to a verse that comes at, after it talks about all the success to verse 16. Listen to what it says. But it's never good when it starts mm -hmm. like that. When he had become powerful, he also became proud. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a turning point. And, you know, I thought of two things, Ruth, that we need to think about in our life. Number one, mm -hmm. sometimes we should embrace problems because problems may be speaking to us of an opportunity that really keeps us in close contact with God, keeps yeah. us away from pride, keeps us dependent on God. Second thing, though, when blessings do come into your life and, and pride begins to, to be uh, an opportunity, you have to guard your heart to not allow proud to, pride to dominate you because it will lead to destruction. Pride always leads us to yeah. destruction. You have to remember that it's not about us. It's about the Lord, and it's about what God is doing in us or can do in us. It's never anything that I could do or you can do. Right. It's all about the one who gives us life every day. Amen. Yeah. Well, a great account that really reminds us of the truths that God has for us regarding pride and guarding our hearts. Thanks for being with us today on Spectrum. Until next time, yeah. have a blessed day.